Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We're so glad you've joined us today. In Paul's letter to the Colossians, he declares that Jesus holds everything together, from the majestic to the microscopic and everything in between, work and family, friendships and faith. In this series, Pastor Skip explores the practical application of Jesus' preeminence so we can make sure that Jesus is at the center of it all. Always only Jesus, Good morning. Uh, boy, that was lively worship. Enjoyed that so much. Thank you to the worship team and the choir. And the choir. Uh, turn in your Bibles, please, to Colossians chapter 1. We're doing this great little series, Always Only Jesus. That's the theme of the book of Colossians, the little letter from Paul. And we're just taking it a few verses at a time. We're in chapter 1. We finish out that chapter today. So I never wanted to be a preacher, and if you would have suggested to me in high school that I was going to end up being a minister, um, I would bare minimum have laughed at you. I could have gotten much worse from, from there on, but nobody in my high school class would have guessed that. In fact, uh, this week I just decided for fun to look through my high school annual and um, read some of the sentiments that fellow students uh, wrote to me, uh, and so here's, um, here, here's what uh, Robert Fowler said, good luck, Skip, you are going to need it. <laughs> my coach, one of my coaches, Coach, coach Goldmeyer, um, said, I hope that you had a good time this year, even though you were rowdy at times. Rick Walker said, what do you say to somebody as messed up as you are? Does that give you a little bit of idea about how I lived my high school days? And then, typical high school unsaved sentiment at the end, we have a couple of days ahead to do some really heavy drinking. <laughs> Bob McAdams wrote to me and said, you have been a unique experience in my life. <laughs> Kathy wrote to me and said, have a neat summer, you make me sick. <laughs> That's in my annual. I got to live with that. And then Jan Hollist wrote to me and said, words cannot express how really weird I think you are. <laughs> okay, so now imagine the shock of the first high school reunion, 10-year reunion, when I come back and they say, so what do you do? And I say, I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they were shocked. But I, I, I would do nothing else. Frankly, to do anything else for me would be a demotion. I love what I do. I am by, uh, what I am by the grace of God. Uh, one theologian said God had only one son and he made him a preacher. And Charles Spurgeon said to his class of ministry students, if God has called you to be a servant, don't stoop to be a king. So I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you here are called to the ministry? Raise your hands. Okay, let's do that again. Now give me the right answer. How many of you are called to the ministry? Raise your hand. There you go. Um, all of y'all are called in the ministry. No matter what job you have, no matter what season of life you are in, no matter what your background, what your education, one area we all overlap in is this, we are all called to be his servants. I'm going to have you notice in verse 23 of chapter 1, he uses the word minister. See that at the end? He said, the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister. And then would you notice down in verse 25, of which I became a minister. Now, typically, we hear the word minister, and we think of a guy in a robe with a collar. Paul did not have that in his head when he wrote that. A minister, the word he uses, meant a servant. And the word is a word that means a humble servant, like a, a busboy. 
uh, somebody on low on the totem pole, but is a servant of Christ. So Paul had an audience that basically, unless they were Christians, did not like what they heard. So if think of the Romans, the Greeks, the Orthodox Jews, the cultists who were around, all of whom, when Paul gave his message of truth, hated it. Hated it. It finally got him beheaded. Do you know that you and I are called to live the Christian life in a society that is not sympathetic with the Christian cause? And our nation is becoming less and less tolerant of people like you and I. Um, I was reading an article this week from the Atlantic magazine, uh, one little statistic they threw in. From 1937 to 1998, church membership in this country hovered around 70%. So I asked 100 people, do you belong and participate in a church? 70 out of 100 would say yes up until 1998. Today, church membership is around 50, less than 50%. Now, we hear that. That's not a big deal to us because we think, yeah, well, church is not a big deal. But they got a little bit deeper. One researcher conducted a survey asking people of all the different people groups which one do you dislike the most? Uh, a large number of Americans disliked the people group labeled conservative Christian. Conservative Christian. Moi. <laughs> and uh, the, there was a poll conducted of progressive activists. Now, you know that's going to be dicey and a lot of fun. So they polled progressive activists asking them what they thought about Christianity and especially conservative Christians, and um, asked the people in the survey to write back their own words, their own thoughts. Here's a few of the sentiments. One person said, kill them all and let their God sort them out. Very loving and tolerant. Another one wrote and said, a torturous death would be too good for them and someone else wrote and said, I regard them as subhuman. It's very Nazi-like rhetoric uh, in reference to this group that you and I are a part of. Well, in the last six verses of chapter 1, Paul is describing his ministry. He ex explains to the church of Colossae his calling. In verse 24, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you to fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I, Paul, became a servant, a minister, according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints." To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Now, why did Paul need to explain his calling and his service to this church? Well, let me put it to you this way. If you got a letter from a man you never met, who was a prisoner, who was accused of being a troublemaker, how would you respond? That is the position the church at Colossae was in. They got a letter from somebody they never met, Paul who was in prison in Rome, who was accused by the Roman government of being a troublemaker. He was on trial for his life, and he needs to explain to them his calling because he wants them to be confident in his authority because he's going to 
and already has been speaking against a false teaching that has come in. So what I want to do in this last paragraph that I just read is show you five characteristics of being a servant of Christ in an unchristian world. Know that for Paul the Apostle, to serve Jesus was the highest possible privilege. He would not stoop to be a king because he was a servant of the living God. Let me give you those five. And the first one maybe isn't the best place to start, but truth is truth, so let me unleash it. Serving involves suffering. I know, you didn't come to church to hear that. But again, truth is truth. And do you notice in verse 24 two words that grab our attention? It's the word suffering and the word affliction. I rejoice in my sufferings for you. Fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the affliction of Christ. The way this is worded, it sounds like Paul says, I'm okay with this. I kind of figured that I would be getting into this, and this is par for the course. I think Paul understood that following Jesus Christ was not a fairy tale. It's not a live happily ever after kind of a thing. He did not live happily ever after. As I mentioned, he was beheaded eventually for his faith at around age 58. Jesus made us a promise. He said, in this world, you will have Suffering, tribulation, tribulation. In this world, you will have tribulation. I wonder how many of us have that underlined in our Bible. Have any of you found that serving Christ can be difficult, can be painful, can be uh, a place where you are persecuted for your faith in Christ? You know when Paul was first saved? What road was he on, by the way, when he was first saved? Damascus Road. So when Paul was first saved on the Damascus Road, and he's in Damascus, God dispatches a disciple named Ananias to go talk to him. And he said, go your way, for he is a chosen vessel of mine, that is Paul, a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my sake." Imagine being told that in the prayer room after an altar call. Welcome to a life of suffering for Christ. People will go, no, thank you. I don't want to sign up for that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is sort of defending who he is, and he brings up the evidence for who he is by the things he has gone through. Listen to this list. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 11 beginning in verse 23, I have worked harder, been put in jail more often, been whipped times without number, faced death again and again. Five times the Jews gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Of course, he means rocks thrown at him. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I have traveled many weary miles. I have faced danger from flooded rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, on the stormy seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be Christians but are not, I have lived with weariness and pain and sleepless nights. Often I have been hungry and thirsty and have gone without food. Often I have shivered with cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Welcome to the ministry, Paul. Paul understood that serving involves suffering. But if and when you suffer, just make sure you're suffering for the right reason. Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. He didn't say, blessed are those who are persecuted for just being obnoxious, pushy, and weird. There's no blessing in that. Make sure that when you are persecuted, be respectful, be loving, be filled with grace with people who are coming at you and disagree with you, knowing that no matter how loving and presenting you are in that, you're still going to get 
hammered sometimes. But I like what one person said. He goes, God is looking for sharpshooters, not machine gunners. Don't make a mess, make a mark. You know, aim for the heart and be very careful. Be, as Jesus said, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now, a little clarification about verse 24. You read it, and it's a little bit puzzling, and some have been confused by it, because he says, I rejoice in my suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the affliction of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. What is he saying? Is he saying that he is adding to the atonement of Christ? Well, he can't mean that because Jesus on the cross said it is finished. It's a finished work. He's not adding to the sacrifice. There's no lack in the sacrifice of Christ. The word that he uses here for affliction is a word never used for the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, always used for us as humans facing the pressures of life or the persecution that we get for being a Christian. So here's how it works. We are, as he says here, the body of Christ, right? That's the term, the church, the body of Christ. The world is out to strike a blow at the head, but they hit the body. The head of the church is Christ. They're aiming for the head. They get the body. And the reason they're not getting the head is the head was here, but he's now at the right hand of the Father in glory. And so he's not around to get you and I, his representatives are. So they aim for the head, but they get the body. And that's what we feel. But know this, even though they are aiming for the head and they're getting the body, the head feels every blow. When Paul the Apostle, before he was Paul, was Saul of Tarsus on that Damascus road, Jesus got his attention, said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He felt Paul or Saul's ire against those Christians in Damascus. The head feels every blow. What Paul is saying is this, I am now taking my turn in the suffering of the afflictions that Jesus himself once took. You know what? If Jesus came back again, they'd crucify him again. And if he came back again and again and again, they would kill him every time. And so he's not around to get, but you and I are. Paul is saying, it's my turn to take the affliction. Paul is not here any longer. Guess who's in turn for the affliction? You and I. It's our turn. You go, oh, that's horrible. Well, that's not how the early Christians saw it. Do you know that the early church saw suffering for Christ as a badge of honor? All the way back to Acts chapter 5, they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. There's so many stories in like Fox's Book of Martyrs of Christians who were facing martyrdom. They counted it a privilege. God gave them that special grace. Cool story, true story. John Wesley, the Methodist revivalist preacher, was riding his horse one day, and a thought came to him. He said, man, I haven't been persecuted for like three days. Something must be wrong. Maybe I've backslidden. Maybe there's sin in my life that I need to confess. He jumps off his horse, gets down on his knees in an open field, and starts praying asking God, search my heart, Lord. What have I done to, a, to, to offend you? Have I backslidden? So as he's praying, somebody recognizes that's that Methodist preacher. Man, I hate him. And so the guy picks up a brick, throws it at Wesley, misses. Wesley jumps up, smiles, sees it as a sign of God's favor, and says, thank God it's all right. I still have his presence. <laughs> he understood Serving involves suffering. Here's the second characteristic. Serving is a stewardship. Look at verse 25. He uses the term, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me to fulfill the word of God. Now, a steward was somebody who took care of somebody else's property. Usually it was a slave or somebody who was hired 
and that person took care of the property management, the household, the people involved in the household. Abraham had a steward by the name of Eleazar who took care of his many flocks, who took care of the 318 paid servants in Abraham's household. Jesus began a parable by saying there was a certain rich man who had a steward, that is an estate manager. So a stewardship is a commission. Paul is saying, I have been commissioned by God for a task. Therefore, I must be faithful to discharge my duty. Now, I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. Serving is not optional. Up to this point, maybe some of you have thought, no, no, no. I'm just, my job in life is to attend things. I will find a seat. I will sit there. I will listen to his words. I will go out and do my thing. Serving Christ is not optional. It's essential. In fact, do you know it's the reason you're not in heaven today? If the goal in salvation was just to get you to heaven, you know what would happen at every altar call? They'd come forward, they'd receive Christ, they'd fall over dead, we'd go out and bury them. They're in heaven. The fact that you're still here shows that you're here for some reason. God wants something more out of your life. So you were born at a certain time, in a certain place, by certain parents, for a certain purpose. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has ordained, foreordained, that we should walk in them. You have a sphere of influence. You have a place to serve, a destiny to fulfill. Only, only you can do that. God saved you on purpose, for a purpose. Ours is to discover that purpose and walk in it. And not just to discover the purpose, but to be faithful in it. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. God saved you basically to do two things. I'm going I'm to sum up your Christian life in the irreducible minimum. So two basic things. Number one, discover your gifts and build up the body of Christ. You have gifts in the church. And number two, reach out to unbelievers, unsaved people, and bring as many to heaven with you as you can. That kind of sums it all up. You and I are called to build up others in the church and reach out to the world around you. To do that, you got to be faithful. Any, any of you ever been to Yellowstone National Park? Okay, it's a good, great place. Okay, so of all the geysers that are in Yellowstone National Park, which is the most popular geyser? Old Faithful. Old Faithful. Interesting, it's not the biggest geyser. It's not the most powerful geyser. There are others that are much taller, much more powerful, but Old Faithful is seen by over 4 million people every year. You know why? Because it's... It's faithful. They know that 20 times every day, every 63 to 70 minutes, it's going to go off. It's predictable. It's faithful. It's always going to do it. So people go there at a prescribed time, wait a few minutes, a little bit of latitude, and it goes off. You don't need to be super strong, super cool, super talented. You just got to be faithful. Just be faithful. So serving is a stewardship. The third aspect is serving brings surprises. Now, the most exciting life you could ever live is a life in service to Christ because you just don't know what's around the corner. One of the surprises that Paul mentions is one that we read but we just kind of skipped over and that's in verse 24 where he doesn't just talk about suffering. What does he say at the very beginning? I now... Ah, rejoice in my sufferings for you. Okay, that's a little weird. You know, most people would say, you know, I, I'm going to make it through. 
I grin, I bear it, I clench my teeth, I'm going to make it. Paul goes, I'll, I'll go a step better. I rejoice in it. Who does that? Well, I'll tell you who does that. A, somebody who's not right in the head. B, somebody who doesn't live in reality, like I'm just always positive thinking, positive confession. Or C, somebody who has tapped into a source outside of the environment and and reality that I'm in, but I've tapped into some kind of a source of joy irrespective of my surroundings. Think of a guy out in the desert who discovers an artesian well. It's bleak, it's hot, it's barren, but he's discovered a source of refreshment, and it's constant. So I rejoice in my suffering. That's a surprise. Unbelievers can't do this. Unbelievers cannot rejoice in suffering, and there's a simple reason for that. For an unbeliever, this life is all there is. If this life is all there is, then any disruption to the good life, if this is all there is, is to be avoided at all costs, certainly never to be rejoiced in, right? But God's kids can do this. His servants can do this because we know no matter how dark the evening gets, the morning is coming. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's going to be much, much better. And not just in the hereafter, but according to the Apostle Paul, he says, I rejoice in my suffering for you. You see, it's worth it to me to suffer because you're going to get a benefit out of it. So Paul is in prison. He's in Rome. But the way he figures it, I'm in Rome. That affords me a lot of time to write a letter to y'all in Colossae and help straighten out your situation. I'm suffering. You're benefiting It's worth it. It's worth it. I'm doing it for you. So suffering brings surprises. But there's another surprise. The real surprise that Paul is all about here is what he calls the mystery. Look at verse 26. The mystery which has been hidden from Uh, ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Mystery. We hear the word mystery, we think of something scary, frightening, eerie, a murder mystery. When Paul uses the word musterion, mystery, he does not mean that. What he means is it's something that was concealed in the past but is now wide open and revealed in the present. It was concealed in the Old Testament. It is now made plain in the New Testament. And there are several such mysteries that Paul the Apostle mentions or the Bible mentions Uh, One is the mystery of the incarnate God. Remember when Paul wrote to Timothy and said, great is the mystery of godliness, God manifest in the flesh. Here is God in human flesh in Christ. Another mystery is the mystery of Israel's unbelief. Uh, Romans chapter 11, Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, about this mystery that blindness in part has happened unto Israel, the Jews, until the fullness of the Gentiles are come in. Another mystery is called the mystery of lawlessness, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul said the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And I got to say, um, just the last two years and now the, the onslaught of uh, uh, certain agendas and uh, what people are trying to pull over on uh, uh, us here in this country, there seems to be a mystery to just the sin and wickedness in this world. It's just so profound. It's it's a mystery. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work, and Paul's point is it's going to culminate till the last days, the Antichrist. And then another mystery is the mystery of the rapture of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
Paul said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be transformed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Here, Colossians, Paul is talking about another mystery, and the mystery here is the mystery of the church. And let me explain that. What was hidden in the Old Testament is the idea that God is going to build a new community of chosen people, and it's not just going to be the Jews. It's going to be saved Jews and saved Gentiles, all that have the same footing and status before God. Let me give you a little illustration that will help you, I think. Uh, Back in the 1940s and 1950s, down south, especially in sort of the flashpoint city of the civil rights movement, Montgomery, Alabama, African Americans were required, if they got on a public bus, to sit where? Back of the bus. You can't sit in the front of the bus. You've got to sit in the back of the bus. Only white folks can sit in the front of the bus. That was until 1956 when it became a law that you can't have that segregation. It's all integrated. You can sit on the bus wherever you want. What was hidden from the Old Testament, revealed in the New Testament, is because of Christ, there's a whole new bus. And we're all on the same bus going to the same place, and every seat is first class. So Jew, Gentile, they're all on the same bus. So those of us who grew up in Christian surroundings, we don't think, you know, okay, there's church, so what? But to somebody back then who was a Gentile, a non-Jew, to be called one of the chosen people of God, that was a huge deal. Because in those days, ancient Jews thought of Gentiles as, okay, you guys can tangle along, but back at the bus. But not now. The mystery that has been revealed and the great... The great surprise is I get to tell everybody, Jew and Gentile, you can ride first class on the bus all the way to the kingdom. Now, how does this truth help those of us in this era serve? Easy. Now when I look at people as a Christian, I can't look at you and say, oh, you're different than I am. You have a different ethnic background. You have a different economic background. You have a different educational background. You're in a different position or status in life and stage of life than I am. Now when I look at you, it's just brother, sister. Son mi familia. Right? We are all part of God's family on equal footing on the same bus at the same table. So serving involves suffering, it is a stewardship, and serving brings surprises. Next is that serving includes speaking. Now, I know some of you are kind of nervous about this, go, not me. I am not called to that. Maybe you, Mr. Preacher Man, are, or Paul the Apostle was, but actually you are to some degree. Now, let me take you to verse 28. Because Paul does not say him, referring to Christ, him I preach. He says him we preach, collective, plural. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. You know that a lot, large part of Paul's ministry was spent in proclamation. But there's three words in this verse that sort of sum up the ministry for Paul. Preach, warn, teach. He preached the gospel, the ultimate truth of salvation. The word preach means herald, keruso, proclaim. It was the job of a town crier before the printing press was available or social media. They had to have a town crier sent out from the government to make an official announcement about any change in policy. He was a preacher. Paul said, I'm a proclaimer, a preacher. I I give people the ultimate truth of the gospel. But I don't just give them the ultimate truth of the gospel. I also have to warn them about the untruths that are out there. That's why he wrote this letter. So I warn every man. And then he uses the word teaching, which is a word I happen to be very fond of, because it tells me that not only should we speak the ultimate truth of the gospel, not only should we warn of the negative truths of all the bad things that are out there, 
But at some point, we need to be teaching people the positive truths that will help them grow in grace. That is the ministry of teaching. The gospel, the teaching ministry. I have found that many pulpits, if not most pulpits, are not filled with teaching. They're filled with exhortation, sort of like a spiritual pep rally. Preacher's going to come up with something cool to say. Everybody's going to applaud. Yeah. Okay. But if that's it, it's about that deep. If that's it, it's about that deep. It's just a spiritual pep rally. Also, some preachers just spend their time warning. It's all the bad stuff. The world's bad. False doctrine's bad. And give me enough time, I'll think of more bad stuff to tell you about. Um, that's hard to listen to. There's no nourishment in that. The nourishment comes in the teaching, where people aren't just told, you need to love more, you need to treat your wife better more, you need to do this more. How about having somebody tell them how to do those things? That's teaching. And that's what he's talking about. I always love the story about this elderly Native American man who went to church one Sunday. The preacher was really fiery and moved around a lot, yelled a lot, and pounded the pulpit a lot, and got people all excited. And he was just kind of using all these histrionics to cover up his lack of preparation. People loved it. And a lot of them said, he preached up a storm. That's the term they use. And they asked the Native American man what he thought. Man, he preached up a storm. What do you think? The old Native American man gave him six simple words. High wind, big thunder, no rain. <laughs> High wind, big thunder, woo! No rain. No depth. What is the goal of all this speaking, especially teaching? Here it is, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Wow, that's a tall order. Perfect? I, I, I got a long way to go with some of you. I got a long way to go with me. Perfect. That's the goal. Mature, complete well-rounded, perfect in Christ Jesus. You know, Jesus never said go into all the world to make converts. He said go into all the world to make disciples of all nations, teaching them to do what I have commanded you. A few years ago, my assistant pastor, who happens to be sitting right here in front of me, Brian, you were taking me to the airport and you asked me a question. I was flying across the United States. And Brian turns to me and he said, um, name five pastors under 40 who are expository teachers. So I immediately named somebody I knew, named him, named somebody else. Didn't know about the third. I could not complete five. They may be out there. I just couldn't complete them. I didn't know of them. And he said, well, let me tell you why I'm asking you the question, because our school of ministry students here at the church, our school of ministry, asked, he said, me this question. Name five pastors under 40 who are expositors. And he said, I, I couldn't complete the list. So he says, this stems from conversations that the School of Ministry students have been having, and they posted this up on Facebook. We're done with glam rock liturgy and preaching for pizzazz that masks the lack of biblical preaching. We want our souls fed, not our emotions tickled. We don't care about the show. We want to know. Those are some smart students. Now, you might say, well, this is good for people who are going into the ministry, but this has nothing to do with my life because I am not a public speaker. I am not a preacher. Now I want to give you a challenge. Challenge number one, pray about, seriously go home and pray about leading a connect group. 
you heard the announcement, say, you know what, I'm going to sign up for that. I'm going to learn how to lead a connect group. Because you might find an area of fulfillment and satisfaction in that kind of discipleship, and maybe that's what you actually have been waiting for. So just pray about going to the leadership training and starting a connect group. You say, well, you've got like 150, 200 connect groups. Let's have thousands of them. Let's have thousands of them. Across this city, you could be a leader. Second part of the challenge, Wednesday night Bible study. It's where we go through the Scripture verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, Old Testament, New Testament. We've done it four, five times as a church. We don't do it all in one fell swoop. It takes us time to do it. But it equips people like nothing else to give you a full orbed view and gives you the depth to find out, and the equipment uh, to, um, to serve better. So pray about that. So serving includes speaking. Let me finish this out with a fifth. Serving requires strength. Now look at the last verse of the chapter. To this end, or for this purpose, to present every man in Christ. To this end, I also labor. It's hard work to do that. I labor striving. Now stop right there. Let me give you a better translation of that. I labor to the point of weariness, to the point of exhaustion. I am engaged in a strenuous contest. That's what the wording means. Because the word labor means the kind of labor that leaves you exhausted at the end of the day. And the word striving is an athletic term, agonizomai, which we get the term agonize from, speaks of an athlete pushing every bit of muscular energy to win the race. Paul the Apostle worked hard. He worked hard. Paul didn't go into a town and say, well, first tell me all the benefits, salary, uh, where's the HR department? I want two, maybe three days off a week. He labored. He worked he said, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, For you remember, brethren, our labor and our toil, laboring night and day. 1 Corinthians 15, I labored more abundantly than they all. I quote Spurgeon a lot. One of my favorite Spurgeon sayings is this one. He said, if you plan to be lazy, there are plenty of places where you will not be wanted. But above all, you are not wanted in the Christian ministry. The man who finds the ministry an easy life will also find that it brings a hard death. Well, that would filter out a lot of people probably in that class by just having that old preacher say that. So Paul says, to this end I labor, striving, I work hard, but here's the key, here's the secret. According to his working, which works in me mightily. Listen, I... I can work hard, but I want you to know, Paul says, I don't work hard. It's not my own strength doing it. It's the strength he gives me to do it. In fact, if you try to do the work of God in the energy of your flesh, that's where you get burnout. You don't get burned out serving, working, laboring with his strength. It's when you do something he hasn't called you to do in the energy of your own flesh that you fall short. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Burnout is just doing that on your own. This is the Philippians 2 principle. Work out your own salvation, for it is God who works in you both to will and do for his good pleasure. You can't work something out that God hasn't first worked in. If God has worked it in you, you can work, you can labor, you can push. Let me close with this illustration to illustrate this point. I was on a different flight, not the flight you took me to, Brian. I was flying out west. I had to land in Phoenix to make a connecting flight. My flight here was a little bit late, so I landed late. And the connection was really, really, really tight. And so I thought, I'm going to miss my, my flight. But, you know, Phoenix is a great airport. 
I'm not disparaging our airport, but come on. I mean, that's like a real airport. And uh, I mean, you can actually go places. So uh, I was in the Phoenix airport, and I had to go through several terminals. And um, I just thought, there's no way. It's on the other side of this huge complex. But in between the terminals, you know how Phoenix has those escalator walkways, right? And so you can walk without them in the middle, but if you, if you walk on the sides, uh, there's this escalator. So I hopped on. I think I jogged a little bit. But the combination of my running and the moving walkway was just enough for me to make my flight. So I was working, but I was cooperating with a power much greater than my own. So work, labor, serve Christ with all your might, all your heart, knowing he will give you the strength and the power that never runs out in abundance to do whatever he has called you to do. Find out what is your stewardship and do it. If he's called you to be a servant, don't stoop to be a king. Well, you might be a king. Congratulations, king, queen, politician, doctor, lawyer, whatever you are, that's good. That's your vocation, but you also have a calling. And the calling is to serve Christ wherever you are. I remember one time I was witnessing to a coworker when I was in medicine, in radiology, and I was passionate about the gospel with this person, and this person stopped me. He wanted to deflect the conversation. It was getting too personal. He said, hey, I'd say, have you ever thought about going into full-time ministry? And I smiled, and I said, I am in full-time ministry. I'm speaking to you right now. <laughs> and I wouldn't be able to do this if I was off somewhere else. So here we are. Let's deal with this right now. So wherever you are, you're, you are in full-time ministry. Consider this your ordination service. You're all called to the ministry. <laughs> Father, thank you for your calling in our lives. We know that uh, some of it is going to be hard just because the truth we proclaim is absolute. There is no flexibility in it. There is only one way to heaven. There's only one Savior who died on a cross named Jesus. There aren't multiple ways. It's not multiple choice. So just giving that message and living that message is going to bring a level of suffering. But Lord, it's a stewardship. And you have crafted us uniquely in various ways with different gifts. And it's a place and a position that only we can fulfill. Lord, I pray that as we decide to get engaged in it, you would surprise us along the way. And Father, I pray that if we have been shy to open our mouths and, and speak, whether it's sharing our faith with an unbeliever or, or teaching somebody who's a young believer how to walk in Christ, I pray that we would find your strength, your ability, and it would so energize us that we would labor more abundantly and push to the finish line. Because uh, no matter how tired we get or no matter how hard it gets, the morning is coming. Sunday is coming. Glory is coming. So motivate us with that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church give.